he was betrayed. What happened that night? Why was that night different from all other nights? Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the famous hymns often sung on the Holy Thursday night is Pange Lingua Gloriosi, Sing My Tongue, the Savior's Glory. This hymn, composed by St. Thomas Aquinas, captures the spirit and the reality of the Holy Thursday. The third stanza goes like this. On the night of that last supper, seated with his chosen band, he, the paschal victim eating, first fulfills the law's command, then as food to his apostles, gives himself with his own hand. Dear friends, with his own hand, Christ gives himself to us. How could he do it on the night he was going to be betrayed, knowing what would happen the next day on the cross. Let us explore. All four evangelists and St. Paul gives us the account of the Last Supper. We have them in Mark 14, Matthew 26, Luke 22, John 23, and in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. So we have five accounts of the Last Supper and four accounts of the institution of the Eucharist. Of these, Paul's narrative in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is the earliest account of the Last Supper and the institution because this epistle was written before any of the Gospels. At the beginning of Paul's brief account of the Last Supper, just in four verses, we find these most striking words. On the night he was betrayed. Verse 23. I pick these words as the theme for today's reflection. To understand better all what happened at the Lord's Passover or the Last Supper, we need to scroll back to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 12, the first reading of Holy Thursday this year, tells us what the children of Israel were asked to do before they left Egypt and embarked on their journey from slavery to freedom. None of them knew that this journey would last 40 years. This came to be known as the famous Exodus event in the history of Israel, the desert experience of the people of God. The second reading and the gospel of the day tell us about what Jesus did before he journeyed to Calvary, carrying the sins of the world and finally laying down his life. Through his great act of sin bearing, suffering, death, resurrection and his self-sacrificial love, Jesus wins the whole human race, the liberation from sin and condemnation. He signs a new covenant and establishes a new Israel. The Exodus episode of the day describes how the Lord through Moses instructed the community of Israel to prepare for their journey to liberation from Egypt. They had to slaughter an unblemished lamb and apply its blood to the two doorposts and the lintel of the house in which they were to partake of the lamb in the same night. This came to be celebrated as the Passover, which the Jewish people faithfully observed. The Passover and the subsequent Exodus events set the background for what Jesus did on the night he was betrayed. The lamb without blemish, the slaughter, the blood, the Passover, all these realities of the Exodus came to be fulfilled in Jesus. These signs in the Old Testament become realities in the New Testament. The blood on the doorpost becomes the mark of salvation for the Israelites. And the blood of Jesus becomes the mark of salvation for us. In Ephesians chapter 1, Verse 7 and 8, Paul says, In him we have redemption through his blood, 
the forgiveness of our trespasses. And St. John says that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses from all sin. 1 John 1 7. The blood shedding and the sacrifice of Jesus completes the exodus of the sinful human race. First, on the night he was betrayed, the awful night. Let's focus a little on the night of Jesus. That was the last Jewish Passover night of Jesus. The last meeting with his disciples before his death. It was the most sorrowful farewell night. That was the night that would become the night of great memory and remembrance. More than all these, the purpose which he, for which Jesus came to the world was uh, being accomplished on that very night. The baptism he waited for was drawing near. And Jesus had said, I have a baptism to be baptized with. And how great is my distress until it is accomplished. Luke 12, 50. The cup that he would drink was very close. Mark writes, they began to be sorrowful and said to him, when Jesus breaks the news of his betrayal, the disciples were drowned in sorrow. Jesus the beautiful drama movie of 2020, filmed in front of a live audience, captures the emotions of the disciples of Jesus during the Last Supper when he says, in a little while you will not see me, John 16, verse 16. The scenes of the Last Supper in the movies, Jesus of Nazareth and the Passion of Christ too, are mind-blowing. As we read from John chapter 13 to 17, we too become the audience of moving, this moving farewell discourse and actions of Jesus, finally culminating them in his priestly prayer in chapter 17. And John writes, after receiving the morsel of bread, Judas immediately went out and it was night. The dark night was made all the more dark by the betrayal of one of his own disciples, Judas. This darkness was conquered by Jesus with the light of his resurrection. The words of Jesus, my soul is very sorrowful even to death, show the intensity of his agony on that night. In his bitter anguish, he opens his heart out to the Father. Falling on his face, Jesus cried out, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus now has come a long way from the silent night of his birth to the most dreadful night before his death. 33 years of his earthly life finally brought him to this awful, sorrowful, and darkest night. Second, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus knew. John tells us in his chapter 13, Jesus knew what was going on and what was in store for him. The first verse says, Jesus knew that his hour had come to pass from this world to the Father. Again, in verse 3, he repeats, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and he had come from God and was going back to God, he loved them. He loved his own in the world and loved them to the end. John emphasizes the knowledge of Jesus, the awareness of Jesus. And what did Jesus know? Jesus knew that his hour had come. Jesus knew that he was going to pass from this world. Jesus knew that the Father had given all things into his hand. Jesus knew that he had come from God. Jesus knew that he was going back to God. Jesus knew that the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. Jesus knew that his betrayer was on the same table with him. 
gathering data from the other gospel narratives, we know Jesus knew that he would be handed over. Jesus knew that Peter would deny him thrice before the cock crows. Jesus knew that all would abandon him. He predicted it. You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. Matthew 26 verse 31. Jesus knew his impending suffering. According to the Gospel of John, six days before the Passover, Mary, the sister of Lazarus, took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And when Judas protests, Jesus speaks of her keeping it for the day of his burial. In John chapter 12, when, when the Greeks come to him to meet Jesus, he answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless the grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life will lose it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. His soul was troubled. John's account of the Last Supper offers a long discourse stretching from chapter 13 to chapter 17. The overall atmosphere of Jesus' love for his soul is seen there. So on the night he was betrayed, Jesus knew. Three, on the night he was betrayed, what did Jesus do? John gives the details of the acts of Jesus. Jesus rose from the supper. Jesus took off his outer garments. Jesus took a towel and tied it around his waist. Jesus poured water into a basin. Jesus began to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus dried them with the towel around his waist. Jesus taught them. Knowing that the hour to drink the bitter chalice had come, knowing that his betrayer, betrayer was on the same table with him, see what Jesus did. He took off his outer garment and tied a towel around his waist, bent the knees before each of his disciples and washed their feet. The towel around the waist has a biblical meaning of slavery. The menial nature of foot washing can be seen in the Jewish tradition. The Jewish slaves were not required to, to do the foot washing for the guests. This was the task reserved for the Gentile slaves and their wives and children. The action of Jesus removing his outer garments and tying the towel underscores the humiliation of his action. The Midrash interpretation of Genesis chapter 21 verse 14 states that when Abraham sent Hagar away, he gave her a bill of divorce and he took her shawl and girded it around her loins so that people would know that she was a slave. At the time of Jesus, it was for the servants to remove the sandals and wash the dusty, dirty feet of house guests who came treading the dirty roads. So it is not difficult to imagine then how startled and shocked the disciples were as represented in Peter when Jesus stooped down and began to wash their feet. The action of Jesus would have utterly stunned and confounded them all the more so when we consider that they had argued and squabbled among themselves about who was the greatest, greatest among them and who would sit where in the reign of God. Humility, submission, servitude, kenosis, self-emptying all in one act. Though he was in the form of God, he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant. 
No greater love than this. Two miracles instituted by Jesus. On that night, Jesus instituted two miracles. One, the miracle of this is my body. Second, the miracle of do this in remembrance of me. The first is the institution of the miraculous Eucharist, the sacrament of the perennial presence of our Emmanuel God with us. Today, when the priest repeats the words of Jesus at every Mass, this is my body, this is my blood. The bread and wine become the body and blood of Jesus, the divine Son of God. So we bow down and worship at the moment of consecration. The second is the institution of the miraculous priesthood, the sacrament of the holy order. In the Eucharist, the priest represents Christ and acts in persona Christi. Every priest does this in obedience to the Lord's words, do this in remembrance of me. These two miracles continue to happen in the church. The ordinary bread and wine, the fruit of the earth and work of human hands, receive a substantial transformation into the body and blood of Christ. This is the biggest miracle, the ongoing miracle in the church. Dear brothers and sisters, the second miracle consists of the ordinary sinful human person becoming another Christ in the Eucharist. These two miracles, which continue to happen in the church, were initiated, inaugurated, and instituted on the night he was betrayed. The old Passover is fulfilled in the new one. The, new, the old priesthood is replaced by the new one, priesthood in persona Christi. And a new commandment is given to love one another. And a new way of life by humble, feet-washing servitude. Can we not say that Jesus institutes a third sacrament here, a sacrament of washing one another's feet, a sacrament of self-abasement and service? This third sacrament, if we can deem it so, makes one a true disciple of Jesus. After washing the feet of the disciples, Jesus says, As I have done for you, you should do also. The example of Jesus as a servant challenges us to become a people of the towel. In this way, Jesus gives two commandments or two ordinances. First, do this in remembrance of me. The Eucharist makes us the people of the table. Two, washing one another's feet. Washing one another's feet makes us the people of the towel. Jesus says, If I therefore the master and teacher have washed your feet, you also do, should wash one another's feet. Finally, Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord has expectation from us. And let me point out three. One, the Lord expects us to accept gratefully and revere the gift of the two sacraments of the Holy Eucharist and the priesthood. We need to make ourselves worthy of it, as Paul tells us in the Corinthians. Two, he wants us to perpetuate them faithfully in remembrance of him. We need to become the people of the Lord's table, true worshippers of the new covenant. Young people today should listen to God's call to priesthood, and we must encourage and support them. And three, Jesus wants us to live our new identity as people of the towel in sacrificial love and humble service. Let me conclude with Revelation chapter 1 verse 5. To him who loves us 
and has freed us from our sins by his blood, who has made us into a kingdom, priests for his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Let us prepare ourselves to meet the Lord on the night he was betrayed. God bless you.